Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, my name is John Lewis. Uh, I'm, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Um, my name is John Lewis. I'm the General Secretary of the Society of Antiquaries. Uh, and the Society is um, a member of the Archaeology Forum, which is why we're hosting uh, this event today. First of all, a couple of housekeeping things. If you hear a fire alarm, there is no drills planned, so it will be the real thing. Um, in which case, go out for that door, turn right through the main doors, and stand next to the statue of Sir Joshua Reynolds, where you will receive further instruction. Uh, toilets, uh, go out here and turn left, and then the gents are left again, and the ladies are right, and all the way down the corridor through the gate doors, and there's another set of doors. Um, it's really, really good to be hosting uh, this event today because, as we all know, there are um, we're coming to a, a, a crucial time uh, in care for the past. Uh, we held a, a large two-day conference here uh, last month on celebrating the 100 years of heritage protection uh, and the 100th anniversary of the 1913 Ancient Monuments Act. So it's quite uh, appropriate to be uh, looking forward um, to how uh, the present uh, uh, economic and political environment will shape heritage over the coming years. Um, we are going to plan to record uh, the discussion here today and make it available on the uh, on our website. But if any of the, the speakers who have agreed to come, friendly agreed to come along and talk on their party's behalf. Um, don't wish to, to have their, their uh, speech made available, uh, then please you know, let me know afterwards and uh, we, we won't use it. But you'll need to sign a consent form if you do want it to be made available. So, without any further ado, I will hand over to um, Jan Wills, Chair of the Institute for Archaeologists, who will be chairing the uh, discussion this afternoon. Jan. Thank you, John. How's the sound? Over here? Well, as, as chair of IFA and um, as IFA is one of the constituent members of the Archaeology Forum, I'd like to welcome our speakers and the audience um, on behalf of TAF uh, to this event today. Um, the Archaeology Forum is a grouping of non-central government archaeological organisations it's very broad in its membership, so it includes representatives of local government archaeology services, uh, employers both private uh, and public sector in archaeology, membership, membership organisations with amateur, professional and members of the public amongst their members, Society of Museum Archaeologists, Society of Antiquaries, Antiquaries of course, our hosts today, and the full membership is, is listed in your programme. Um, TAF uh, works, TAF <coughs> members work together to influence legislation and policy uh, as they affect archaeology in the wider historic environment, especially through advising the all-party parliamentary archaeology group. And therefore, TAF members are, have a very keen interest in the policies of the political parties, um, particularly as they build towards um, formulation of manifestos, and prepare for the next Westminster election. We're meeting um, today in a, a time of change for heritage. When is it not a time of change? But there's a lot going on in all of the countries in the UK at the moment in terms of um, legislative change, organisational change in Scotland, in Wales, and in England, where it's, of course, proposed to um, split uh, English heritage, our national um, archaeological body into, into two with different sets of responsibilities. At local level there is what I would describe as a crisis in local government with cuts in, in budgets and services threatening the protection given to local heritage. So it's against this background of change at both national and local level that we meet this afternoon and um, we're particularly keen to hear from um, our guests about their policies um, in respect to these issues and archaeology and the heritage generally. 
Our program this afternoon um, consists of presentations from um, the Green Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats. We don't, I'm afraid, have a representative from the Scottish National Party, but um, our, our um, IFA Chief Executive, Peter Hinton, will probably be speaking um, in that slot in the program this afternoon. Um, good substitute, I'm sure you agree. <laughs> Uh, the Minister, Ed Vasey, is arriving at 3.20, so he will join the panel at that point. And once we've heard from all of our speakers, we have a question session, um, so um, please think and formulate your questions as we hear the presentations from our guests. I'm now going to move um, to uh, begin our presentations and invite um, Jenny Jones from the Green Party uh, a member of the London Assembly, and I gather an archaeologist at uh, an earlier time in her career. And uh, Jenny's going to speak to us first. Jenny. Thank you. I have to, um, it, it's true I used to be an archaeologist. Um, I had to admit to Jan earlier that I was a really bad archaeologist. So if there's anybody who worked with me, if there's anybody in the room who used to work with me, they'll vouch for that. There's no false modesty there. Um, and I was talking to uh, Lord Retail before we opened, and he said that we'd been on the panel before, which must be 12 years ago, quite a long time ago. And he said at that point, I said, the Green Party has got a policy, but I couldn't find it. Um, but I have excavated it. And, um, and, and it's here, and I'm embarrassed to say that it's dated October 96. Um, so it could possibly be more up to date. But I'll perhaps just read it quickly because it's not very, well, well it's obviously very extensive, but um, it, it won't take long to read. And it, um, it does, I think, sum up where we're coming from as a party. Because um, a, as an archaeologist, it, it does mean that I'm a traditionalist and I do respect the past very deeply. But at the same time, I'm a radical and I'm clear that we can't protect the whole past but it's to our detriment if we lose too much of it. And, and personally, um, archaeology for me was an absolute pleasure from day one to, to the very end when I decided I should, just couldn't earn enough money for doing it. Um, <laughs> and moved on to politics. Um, I'll read out what our policy is. Um, we are committed to the inter integration of archaeological concerns into all aspects of land use and development strategies. We think there should be a review of PPG 16 with a view to strengthening the obligation of developers to provide adequate uh, resources, whilst allowing archaeological concerns to be paramount in deciding how to achieve this. We would want a review of scheduled monuments legislation with a view to strengthening the protection it affords to sites and monuments, a tightening of the law regarding the misuse of metal detectors on archaeological sites. We would promote the teaching of archaeology at all levels of education to raise awareness of archaeology's relevance to the landscape, to the social fabric, to the economy, and to all other issues. And we would continue and expand resources available for archaeological research, conservation, and management. And we would review the legal framework regarding maritime wrecks with a view to affording better protection for these sites. Now, the fact is, I know that there are moves to, to try to make councils more responsible to make sure that they um, do take into account archaeology. But having been a councillor myself, I can tell you, as Jan mentioned earlier, the cuts to local government mean that there are some very, very hard decisions. And if local government, if local councillors have to make a choice between daycare for the elderly and protection of an archaeological site on their, in, in their territory, they may not feel that they can actually support the archaeology. It's a very, very difficult situation. And it's a pity that the minister isn't here now to hear me say <coughs> that I think that this government is responsible for a savagery on the fabric of our social network in, in Britain, in the way that they have um, cut benefits, in the way that they have cut money to local government, which is where the real democracy happens. It's where people actually can speak directly to their councillors. They councillors on a day-to-day -day basis. I couldn't go in my front garden to try to cut the grass or trim the trees without people stopping to talk to me about a solar panel they wanted to put on their roof and they couldn't get permission for. Local democracy is where it happens. It's where protection for 
the archaeology really has to be, but at the same time you have to fund it. And this government has cut local government to the bone, to the point where local government is having to make very, very hard decisions. So personally, I think that we're in a situation where archaeology actually is going to be harder and harder to finance. Even when I was an archaeologist, and I stopped being an archaeologist in 99, um, the fact that archaeology was developer-driven was a huge problem, an absolute huge problem. I've seen in London, there does seem to be, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, there does seem to be a little bit more understanding from developers generally, and it seems that sites in London have often had um, a lot of, they, they've had time for the archaeology, they've actually allowed the archaeology to be um, an important component of the overall development. <laughs> But even so, I think that archaeology, to some extent, has to be for itself. There doesn't always have to be an economic outcome or a social outcome for a piece of archaeology. Sometimes it's just the right thing to do, to find out more about our past. Because if we don't learn from our past, then we're doomed to repeat mistakes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm sure that um, our audience will want to pick up some of those points on local government in the question session later on. Um, we now move to Lord Stevenson from the Labour Party. Um, Lord Stevenson is a spokesperson, I believe, in um, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport and will speak to us um, on behalf of the Labour Party. Thank you, Lord Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, thank you also, John, for everything. John, where have you gone? Introduction. Um, it's a privilege to be here today. I should explain I uh, was a very reluctant acceptant, acceptee of the invitation, which is a terrible thing to say, but the invitation was, um, well, because you're wonderful people and I want to support you and, uh, and all that, and uh, as uh, all politicians say, I'm here to listen as well. Um, but the, the problem I found myself in, and the reason I delayed slightly in, re in responding, is that, is that we are uh, incredibly disciplined uh, opposition. Uh, we don't uh, like to speak before we're ready to do so, and uh, with 18 months to go to an election, this is not the time to start exposing what I think uh, the, uh, the, the policies of my party should be going into that election. Um, and if I were to do so, I would soon stop being a frontman spokesman for DCMS. <laughs> uh, that having been said, um, Nobody ever listens to the Lords, and no, I say this. <laughs> Flanked on my right was one of the great exponents of the Lords. He's uh, got some thorn in our flesh and <laughs> popping up at all times doing all sorts of things. And our newest uh, member, Jenny, who did, was very too, far too polite not to say that she is about to become a member of the Upper House and will join us in the early, early November as Baroness Jones of... Molston. Molston. Which I'm sure will leave you to ask her about that later. Anyway, um, our point... Our, our position, therefore, I mean, I've said this, I can't really give you very much detail because that detail does not exist. We are genuinely in this listening mode. There are something like um, 18 working parties looking, crawling across Labour policy. And while some announcements were made at uh, the conference a couple of weeks ago, those were more, I think, tactical and specific. And uh, certainly, in fact, did not go down as far as, well, why is it down? It didn't reach out as far as archaeology and the wider context. However, um, the reason I, I thought I would change my mind and speak is, is partly because I realised all the other parties were going to, or the Scotlands, <laughs> believe it or not, have run away. <coughs> and that tells you about the referendum a year from now. But the, uh, the issue was that I, wa I just wanted to make a few points about where we might be moving, because I think, I think it's been an interesting time. John mentioned the, the, the crisis that seems to be affecting so much of what you do and how, and how you operate. And I think, it, I think I wanted to think a little bit about that because I did a bit of work in the House early in the year in some areas to do with this. And in particular, I was involved in a rather odd debate about HMS Victory in 1744, about which I'd like to return. Um, the thing that, that strikes me thinking about uh, the role of heritage and the, and the way in which it contributes to our social and, and political and cultural life is that it in common with very many parts of, of the government's uh, machinery, gets uh, forgotten in the bad times and inadequately rewarded in the good times. So while we recognise that it's been a problem, and certainly our party, my party <coughs> has been guilty of, of some of that, 
it's, it's not alone. There are many, many areas of, of, of public life which do not get the attention that they should do. And what I'm going to say is I want to try and reflect a little bit about what might be a plan for trying to re remedy that. It is true that there is no overarching vision, as far as I can detect, within government about this work. Um, there is no um, sense of, of ownership, there's no particular department that would claim that it had all the uncertainties. And the problem is compounded by the fact that the department that does have an emotional responsibility is the Department for Culture, Media, Media and Sport, uh, the Minister for whom is yet to appear, and hopefully when he does, he will have some answers for it. It's therefore the worst of all possible worlds. It's, it's not given a strong leadership anywhere in the government. That leadership that is, that is there is spread out over a number of departments, many of which were touched on in the opening remarks. And the department which has the, the budget to string, or the responsibility for it, is unable to make its case with any, any strength. Well, that's easy to analyse. How do you sort that out? Well, the first thing I've learned from my time in working in the arts and media and then subsequently to be responsible for it in terms of opposition, is that it, 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 there are no simple answers to that question. I mean, clearly responsibilities have got to be built between DCLG, between BIS, the Business Department, and the Education Department, and any or all of those could be places within which this responsibility could be placed, and, and I think there are good points and bad points from that. If your concern is primarily on planning, then it obviously helps to have a, a strong voice in DCLG. If it's in relation to the broader development agenda, however, that would need to accommodate how you would operate within biz for construction and other matters are dealt with. And of course, if you want to think about making sure that everybody understands and enjoys the work that you are doing, there's plenty of anecdotal and, and real evidence to suggest that this is that education as a whole is something that we should all be thinking about from school right through to lifelong. Just look at the programs on television in this, about this then clearly the Department for Education would be an appropriate one. So there are many possibilities here, but not all of them are necessarily the right ones. For example, if uh, I've, I've been doing some work on copyright recently, which is a, has a aspects of the work that you do and is important in, in terms of uh, our own economic development as a country. But that is uh, hopelessly uh, straddling between the Business Department and DCMS, with the Minister claiming responsibility for IP based in biz, which is Lord Younger of Lecky, member of the upper house. But the actual work and much of the initiatives coming from the department which represents the creators, which is DCMS and indeed in particular Ed Vesey, who does a, does a very good job in this area. But, it, but because there is a stasis within the department, within quite all, nobody is prepared to, to take it up because it just looks like trouble if you were thinking about taking an, up an issue and, and working with it across government. You certainly wouldn't choose one for which there were two competing departments because the chances of getting anything done in the short time that one is a minister would probably be zero. So the practical aspects of this analysis, which is that heritage is not being looked after properly, those that work and support heritage are not being given sufficient resources, and the, 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 the problem that they face, that we all face in that is very like that of the libraries, the public library service, which is a responsibility of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, which is funded by DCLG but the actual main usages are in education, and they are complete mess. So we have to be careful what we wish for, but I think it's an issue we need to come back to. And then more recently, you have to look at the way in which government, the machine in, in totality, has looked at heritage and uh, issues related to that. And, and it's very surprising to me, looking back over the figures, to see how badly uh, this area has suffered in, in the past. If, if you look for, the, last, for, for the, the major settlements of the last, say, 10 years, consistently the built environment heritage more generally has underperformed the arts and the, and the culture and the media by about one or two percentage points. So where 5% was going to the Arts Council and its associated bodies, 3% or even less was going to English heritage and, and their bodies. And the same is broadly true in the devolved territories as well. So the puzzle is, why is that happening? I mean, if we could sort the question of where was this placed in government, how could you then address this question of why does heritage underperform relative to other arts? And I think the answer to that is that if you watch what the others have done, they've been quite smart in getting organised and arguing a case specifically and directly to the Treasury. Now, in the good old days, when uh, uh, that Mr Brown was in the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he had a fondness for picking up things and running with them. So it was quite easy if you could just attract attention to get a little bit of a bunch out of a budget. 
not so easy nowadays, but I still think the principle is quite important. So the, when I was working in the film industry, we were very lucky to catch his eye, and as a result of which we got, which I, I know this has been recorded, so I've got to be a bit careful, <laughs> what seems to me to be a rather soft, a set of <coughs> soft money, which basically uh, is aligned on the basis that if you uh, make a film in Britain, then you get 25% of that cost underwritten by the Treasury. Now the argument is economic. The argument is that if you make the film in Britain, you're employing people, you're using props, you're using dressmakers, you're using vacations, you're taking stuff out of hotels, you're doing all sorts of good things. So there is a there is an argument for it. But it's it's basically it's, it's just a subsidy by another name. And and the, and the argument certainly took five years to make, but once they've been there, they not only have sort of survived the end of the Labour administration in 2010, but they've been adopted by the Conservative uh, Liberal Democrats, and we should thank them for that, and even extended to what's called high-end television and to games making. So video games, which your children are playing even as we speak, now get a subsidy from your tax, tax pounds, and you should reflect on that. <laughs> if it's true for such valuable things as high-end drama, that includes Downton Abbey, which I suppose has got some relevance to what we're saying today, but other, other aspects, more contemporary people than that, uh, then you've also got to think about uh, why is it that the value that you are putting back into the economy through your work, supporting the, the knowledge and understanding of the past, the development of good practices in areas that, that, that we care about, the, the education of those who should know more about their history and be aware of, its, uh, of the dangers of the which it is, to prevent departments such as DCMS gifting precious wrecks such as HMS Victory 1744 to a consortium with apparently no financing whatsoever and only the possibility of being able to undertake the conservation and support work that's required for that when they sell some of the artefacts which are supposedly in the care of Her Majesty's government. Doesn't stack up for me. And therefore, I think that you know, if we're thinking forward about this, then I want to urge those who have involvement in this to think hard about the responsibilities that the state should have in this area, to argue the economic and the cultural and the social arguments that can be made, but to think very hard about the way in which employment and contributions to our standard of living and everything else comes from the work you do, and to make the case that there are subsidies operating in parallel areas, why are they not applied? <laughs> heritage. So in that sense, I'm looking for a new paradigm. If we can fund the, the latest uh, Star Wars film through, through our tax plans going to support that being made in Pinewood, I don't see why we can't also support the raising of HMS Victory if that's what's required, but certainly the preservation of these amazing guns, pictures of which are available on the website, which I'm sure you all well know, but for which, if we're not careful, the two that already disappeared will be joined by others and we will lose the chance to understand more about what it was about that particular ship in that particular period which was so special and so extraordinary and therefore complete that story for our own selves, for our children, for our grandchildren to understand better who we are and where we come from. We move on now to our third speaker, um, Lord Reedsdale, uh, who speaks on behalf of the Liberal Democrats, and who will be familiar to many of uh, us in the audience from the All uh, Party Parliamentary Archaeology Group. Lord Reedsdale. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, I stand in front of this audience. I remember um, last time we did it, a number of years ago, uh, we had almost the same argument. And the, uh, the, the charge was thrown at us, what have you ever done? Well, I started the Old Party Archaeology Group. I've worked with Roger Bland on many of his incredibly successful campaigns to actually save quite a lot of things. And I've worked as part of the Troika, uh, which is myself, uh, Lord Renfrew, and, um, <coughs> and Lord Howarth, who is... Basically, we have trained a lot of pieces of legislation over the time. Ed Basie, who has been incredibly supportive and is one of the better ministers, has actually recognised that we've been a pain on the arse to him and uh, that we've been pushing things. So before you actually turn around and say, ha, you should be spending more,
Just remember this. The panel don't actually have any ability to spend any money. And I also would like to throw back at you guys that having the same old arguments about cuts is actually irrelevant and pointless. Um, I just say this because I got a complete mauling at the University of Arts because I was speaking on sustainability in arts and energy consumption. I made a very good speech. <laughs> <laughs> then the entire audience decided as one that during the entire question time the politician was going to be beaten up for lack of spending on the arts. I took about two questions and I thought, well, I'll tell you why I'm really going to enjoy this. So I said, well, there's a lot of big problem with art. Is, well, some of it is inspirational and gives ideas and, 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 and is fantastic. 99% of art is really not very good. And, and it just kicked off. <laughs> really, I said, why should the government fund rubbish art? And we have a bit of the same problem with archaeology. We're a victim. I, I just, you know, I was just in the, uh, in, in the house coming to the tube, and I walked past um, the, where the underground car park is outside Westminster Grey Hall. And of course, that is the reason that we have funding for archaeology at all. In the 70s, one of the most important areas for archaeological excavation was dug up without any archaeology taking place whatsoever when they put the car park in. So they changed the law and said, right, we're going to fund this. But the problem was, we had a thriving archaeological community of volunteers who felt empowered, who stood up and shouted. And by funding it, we then turned it into health and safety. Can't go near a site with a hard hat and, 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 and laws about exactly what you can do. I mean, who cares if a few archaeologists get buried? You know? <laughs> That's the archaeological record in a few years. But the problem is, we've taken away from people archaeology. Now we gave we gave it back through the time team, but you know, do their best. You know, they are almost an archaeological record in their own right now. You know, you can't stick on the format of one program holding the whole thing together. You know, there is some really stunning, exciting stuff. I was up with Clive Waddington in his dig at Amble, which was looking at um, a site continuously occupied uh, from some, from before the Neolithic. And, um, you know, it was the Great Trondheim um, ice collapse which led to a, a tsunami which cut Britain off from the rest of Europe, but we actually had that layer of tsunami. Now, he managed to get £75,000 off the Heritage Lottery Fund to dig that layer up to find out if there's any flints underneath. I haven't spoken to him since. But that's a sealed layer. You know, that's incredibly rare. It was exciting. It was on the local telly, it was on national telly, it was on countryside. It <coughs> got people excited. Well, what I have a problem with is it's very difficult to get people excited every day of the week on developer led archaeology. But that's what pays for all our archaeology, that's what pays for the infrastructure. And the big problem there isn't any money in local government. It doesn't matter what, we can have the massive fight, but there is no money. The government's bust. I would love it. Politicians must come up with money. Well, no, politicians can come up with money. They just dip their hand in your pocket in one way or another. So there's no point in them turning around and saying there's going to be new money. I would throw back, you know, instead of having the usual argument of saying, you know, the minister's got to do his best, I think we have got a minister who's been doing his best. You know, and I actually think the last government was doing quite well. The funny thing is, things have their moment in the sun. Why does the Arts Council get more? Because you had more people shouting. And this is what we came back to before. We've got to get archaeologists shouting again. And it's not all doom and gloom. We have this every single time we have a discussion. It's doom and gloom. Yes, I know we're having cuts. I know we're under pressure. But when you go to other countries where there's absolutely no protection whatsoever, you look at this country, there is a genuine passion about the history of this country. There's enormous amounts of... Um, of passion amongst volunteers, which we have to harness. If we're not getting the money from central government, we've got to think of other ways of getting it. Now, as John Lewis will know, I'm an expert at trying to winkle money out of the most bizarre sources, <laughs> and hopefully we'll be very successful at that for the society. But you've just got to start thinking about that. I'm, I'm on the board of York Archaeological Trust. Um, York Archaeological Trust, the most exciting, is the most successful archaeological trust, does it on the back of a tourist attraction. Yeah? It was a car park. 
It was, it was meant to be a car park, that space, not, you know, it's basically a concrete cellar. But then they've got your cardiological trust, you know, the Jorvik Viking Centre, fantastic. And then you have the Jorvik, you have that, the Jorvik Festival, where you've got vast numbers of Vikings walking around. I mean, I love it, you go into uh, Sainsbury's, and you've got a Viking, you know, <laughs> dressed up with, with a battle axe over his shoulder, and, you know, there's an old lady saying, are you going to take all day, love? <laughs> you know, it's, it's completely ignored. But you have that, and, and it's a massive draw. It brings in millions of pounds to York each year. And the reason was that York faced a problem. There was a dip in numbers that they had to fill. So they actually got all the Vikings and reenactment people together to try and fill that. And it's become, a, it's become one of the biggest draws in the city. And as seen as such. Now, I'm not saying that there's, there's that solution for everybody. And we have to make sure the laws are right, and we're doing our best on pieces of legislation. We have to make sure that the gaps are filled, and we're trying to do with that with the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And I very much understand just how under pressure, because I get letters every single day from archaeologists, not every single day, um, both doesn't come on Sunday. Uh, <coughs> but you know, you do get, I do get quite a lot of people saying we've got problems. And I understand that, but we're not going to be able to change that problem with money coming in, it's not going to come for the next two, three, four years. You know, whatever happens after the next election, there's going to be more cuts or taxes are going to have to go up. Nobody ever says it, but that's exactly what's going to happen. We've still got this massive debt that we've got to deal with. So I think what I would throw back at you guys is, as I did last time, is it's not about saying we need more money. Yes, we do need more money. and. We will push for English heritage to have its day in the sun, which seems to go round in in, um, in circles. I mean, British Museum was the one that everybody wants to cut, and now they've got a new, well, I mean, it's not new anymore, but the director is now, you know, the shining light in the British Museum gets a lot more money than it did. We've got to actually push that and get English heritage much more into the forefront and much more attractive to politicians to get money to. But if we really want to change this around, we actually have to take the lead and make it more ex exciting. Um, because, you know, a politician comes from the Greek, man of the people, man of the city. The politicians will only do what people on the ground really want. If there's no big voice shouting for it, then people just don't do it. But when you do have a big campaign and you do have the telly and you do have this going forward, then it really does take off. And then there's much more of a will for politicians to actually start dipping into that pocket and fighting other people for their money. We have been quite lucky that we've had a group of people who have really, really been keen on making sure this happened, without which I think it would be a worse situation. But it needs support from you guys. dig out my Viking costume for the next event. I'm sure there's lots there that um, Lord Reedstyle has given us that we'll want to uh, re uh, react to in, in question. Um, as I said earlier, um, we don't have a representative from the Scottish National Party, so um, we're going to uh, take Peter Hinton's contribution next. Um, Peter is Chief Executive of the Institute for Archaeologists, um, and uh, one of the leading members of TAF. So over to you. Thanks, Jen. You did. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to uh, add my thanks as uh, convener of the Archaeology Forum to uh, the speakers today for. Uh, being brave enough to come and uh, stand before you and uh, in due course answer uh, a series of, of no doubt penetrating questions about um, their party's policies. Um, I'm not, if there's any confusion, here speaking on behalf of the Scottish National Party, by the way, I'm here on behalf of the Archaeology Forum. Now, your speakers, uh, including the Minister, before today were given uh, a short briefing paper um, setting out some of the concerns uh, that we thought they might uh, care to address. And I thought it'd be helpful if I just ran through some of the things that were in that briefing paper. Um, 
going out of order, one of the bullet points set before them reads, why, in spite of all the evidence, Rupert, um, the historic environment is frequently perceived as a net cost to the public purse. I fully accept the case that much of the heritage sector has been obsessed in its advocacy in trying to secure increases or reduce cuts uh, in public sector funding for the heritage, and, and that is an important role. The Archaeology Forum, I think, has rarely, if ever, made arguments based on the need for further funding. The arguments that it has made is about the fragility of the services that exist, in particular the local government services which we talked about. One of the principal roles of the local government archaeology officer is to lever in developer funding, of the sort that Jenny was referring to earlier on, to pay for archaeological works. Um, Jenny, I think our view is that by and large developer funding works, it's not perfect in every case, but developers have taken up their environmental responsibilities and providing there is um, a sufficiently well-resourced local authority service there to guide them and specify what they should be doing. The system seems to work reasonably well. Now, I'm famous for quoting the wrong statistics in this room about how much money that is, but this week's figure is approximately £95 million per year in England coming from developers, um, some of whom will be public sector, I admit, but most of them will be private sector, to fund archaeological work. Those people that lever it in nationally probably cost about <coughs> one fiftieth of that sum to local governments. So the leveraging power that they've got in terms of getting um, the private sector to pay for increased understanding of the archaeological heritage is enormous. Um, our concern, of course, is that regardless of what the um, National Planning Policy Framework may wish local government to do, their responsibility is not statutorily required, uh, it is a discretionary function of local authorities, um, and it is very vulnerable. And so, whilst the um, Green Party statement may date to an earlier, an earlier era of PPG 16, the strengthening of planning guidance has always been one of the things that the Archaeology Forum has, has looked for, and we do believe that the National Planning Policy Framework, the provisions within it, are good and serve archaeology very well, um, but they only work if there are people there to enforce it on the ground. And I know we've got some questions coming up about that. Um, the panel was also treated to sight of a, a letter which has been sent by the Council of British Archaeology, the Association of Local Government Archaeology Officers and IFA to every chief planning officer and every chief executive of um, English local authorities setting out what our concerns are and what the problems may be um, for local authorities if they dispense with that, um, that uh, <coughs> local authority archaeology service. Um, One solution that has always been promoted by the Archaeology Forum is a statutory requirement for local authorities to have access to a properly staffed historic environment record. Uh, and it's probably pertinent at this point to remind people that in 2010 the Draft Heritage Protection Bill was produced, never got before Parliament, um, but it had a provision in it to make historic environment record services a statutory requirement. Um, it was recognised at the time that it was not an additional burden on local authorities and it attracted cross-party support. Uh, so one of the things I think that we'll always be looking for from political parties is a commitment to reviving that provision or if that is not possible, finding some other mechanism to encourage and support local authorities to, to um, meet their responsibilities to the historic environment. We, and this has this been touched on very effectively by, by Lord Stevenson, we, we talked about 
the need to make the argument about the contribution that archaeology makes to economic growth. Clearly there are arguments that, about the contribution we make to cultural and social um, regeneration. Um, economic growth at the moment is, of course, top of government's agenda, and we understand why that is. Um, but we must also reflect on, on Jenny's point about the value, almost in its own right, of protecting important parts of, of our environment. Um, the other issue that we flagged up to our, our, our political friends um, related to the treatment of the underwater cultural heritage, the failure so far of government to sign the UNESCO Convention on the treatment of the underwater cultural heritage uh, and our concerns about how government's commitment to abide by the principles set out in the annex of that convention um, can actually be adhered to under the current model for uh, investigating uh, victory 1744 um, and I couldn't match Lord Stevenson's excoriating account of, of, of the present arrangements. Um, Lord Stevenson also referred to the um, range of government departments with responsibility for archaeological matters uh, and of course one of our constant concerns in recent years has been the need for DEFRA and its colleagues to ensure that through the process of the common agricultural policy reform that environmental stewardship continues to protect the historic as well as the natural environment and after an alarming excursion during the summer I think we're feeling a little bit more reassured about that at, the, at this stage. And the final bullet point was the role of national heritage bodies and we think particularly at the moment of the proposed uh, division of English heritage into two chunks um, and how the service that they provide towards the protection of the heritage could better be aligned with that provided fragilely, if that's a word, at present by local government services. Lord Stevenson explained to us why at the moment it's not a brilliant time for political parties to be setting out policy positions this far ahead of the next election. And we were aware of that when we set this event up, because one of the things we thought this um, event might uh, help with was actually getting some of our ideas across, which may actually assist in that process um, as, it, as it goes forward over the, over the coming months. Uh, and I'm hoping that I'm not going to be contradicted by any of our colleagues in the Archaeology Forum if I say that forum members are ready and willing to advise and assist in the development of policy positions for any of the political parties fighting in any of the forthcoming elections around the United Kingdom. Uh, and our message is, is a simple one. Uh, the popularity of archaeology has, has never been as great as it is now and uh, uh, a couple of speakers has, have referred to our successes in uh, getting lots of airtime on television. Um, you, know, you can't turn on television at night without one of the members of this audience peering back at you and telling you something exciting about what they found. Um, most of the legislative and policy provisions we're looking for um, are not controversial, and nor um, are they costly. Uh, it would be uh, probably setting entirely the wrong term to talk about tone, to talk about cheap and easy votes, but I, I just leave that thought for, for, for people to take away with them. And then finally, the one other thing that was in the briefing document that um, I'm hoping Ed Vasey will address when he enters the room uh, is the absence of a current policy or vision statement on the historic environment. The last government in 2010 produced a vision statement of the historic environment and its great strength was that it was not a DCMS statement, it was signed off across Whitehall and that I think gave DCMS a lot more clout, potential clout, in its negotiations with other departments where it felt that policy positions might be taken by colleagues elsewhere in Whitehall that were detrimental to the historic environment. Um, to be able to cite a government policy and not a DCMS policy. 
Uh, that policy statement, HMG policy statement, has disappeared from the DCMS website. The, the really techno adept, if they drill down, can actually find it in an archival corner somewhere, but it really takes a bit of finding. I think okay, Heritage Alliance have established that, the, the link to the mysterious corner of, of, of the website where it lurks, but it's clearly not seen as a current document. And uh, I, I think we would be very pleased to see commitments from any of the political parties to try and get a pan-government view on the, on the value of heritage and uh, its study through archaeology. Now, unhelpfully, Jan, at that point, and before the Minister's arrival, I kind of run out of steam. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand it back to the on chair to try and decide what on earth to do now. That's fine. But the questions might be one of the options. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes now before the anticipated arrival of our final speaker, um, Ed Maisie. So I think perhaps we might um, extemporise and do a few questions. I know that Lord Stevenson has to leave early, I think. That's what time do you have to go? Just after four. four. So um, in providing the opportunity now for a few questions, you might want to bear in mind that Lord Stevenson has to leave early and the Ministry is not yet here <laughs> and um, structure your questions accordingly. I'm going to abuse my position as chair to um, kick off, if I may, and uh, just pick up something that uh, Lord Stevenson, I think, said in his uh, presentation, or, or commented, uh, or questioned. And I think um, you said, Lord Stevenson, why isn't the value of heritage recognised uh, across government? And I think, personally, I feel that we, we've struggled through a number of different administrations of various complexions to really um, make a mark and convince government that heritage, that archaeology does matter for all the wide range of reasons that various of our speakers have touched on, not only its intrinsic value in terms of um, information about our past, but also all of the economic and social uh, values that we feel it has. So might I ask you, Lord Stevenson, just to... Um, respond to that and the question of why we're not getting through the message on the value of heritage in government. Um, well, there isn't an answer to that question because obviously there was an answer we would be doing it anyway. But, but the, uh, I think it, the, what I was trying to say is because, because for all the right reasons, various departments will have heritage on their agenda. But inevitably, it comes seven, eight, nine in the list of things that they have to do. Well, we still mentioned that in his remark. So you, you get this situation where the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is unfortunately weak and not able to try and sign, the, sign off the paperwork that would get things going. So the, the idea of a unified vision uh, for, for heritage is, is a great one. And I, mean, I, I do remember that being discussed when I was working in Upper Town. And I'm sorry that it didn't get picked up because that, that's a, a, a first step. One thing that you, one might try, which which it promises that there are dangers if, if everybody tries it, but the um, I remember a few years before that there was a concern that, that, that architecture wasn't being given sufficient weight in, in decisions, particularly with the, the PFI and others uh, beginning to produce huge amounts of new government buildings. There was a concern that the quality of the built environment would suffer. In that sense, and what happened was that there was a move quite successfully to appoint in every department from the existing portfolio of ministers one who would be the architecture champion. Now, you could see how that might work in, in, a, in a more restricted range, perhaps across my tour, if you can find the political willingness to commit to appointing within the current plethora of ministers one who would have a particular responsibility for heritage in that department. And at least there would be a way of, of trying to get some across department are working on that. It would be a bit cumbersome and it wouldn't have much authority and of course this, without the budget there is very little chance but at least it would raise awareness and it would be a step down that path that we need to, to take on. The other thing that has been quite interesting in Whitehall in recent years has been the development of, of um, a, a, a specific branch in every department. I mean, it's, it's paused now because budgets are tight but 
as well as having uh, a chief economist in every department, there, be, there began to be a, a veritable rash of chief scientific officers. Uh, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to suggest that that office that they would have might include a specific responsibility for, say, heritage and So again, you would have in every department somebody who had a right to see the major papers, the major policies, who had right of access, as the chief scientist does, to the permanent secretary and to the secretary of state. And again, an issue could be uh, either organically raised within the department or might be something that you could write in about and say, oi, please talk to your chief scientist who will be briefed about this particular issue. There's a real concern about that. So I mean, those would be the sort of things you can do as a media's guide to getting stuff to stick in Whitehall. Uh, but the main problem is, is, that, is, is that, uh, as I was trying to argue, you need a narrative. You know, we're all about narratives these days. And a narrative has to be something that will catch the eye of somebody who's reasonably seen you in the treasury. If you can't do that, it's trouble. Yeah. That's a challenge. Um, Jenny, I think you wanted to follow up. Um, I, I spent my morning in the House of Lords um, because of, although I'm not introduced yet, I was doing an induction, which is where they teach you about how to table questions, where to park your bike, I fall asleep on red benches without being obvious to cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things uh, one of the things that um, what stressed me is how there is a very strong feeling of camaraderie in the House of Lords, which which doesn't exist in quite the same way in the House of Commons. And that's my preface to saying that I want to disagree with Lord Reedsdale on this. <laughs> Um, because he said earlier, oh, it's not about money. But actually, of course, it is. It, because money is commitment. And of course, there is more money. Because you can decide not to do some things that your heart is set on. For example, the HS2 rowing, the um, uh, replacing Trident. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you can decide not to do, which actually does leave some money in the budget. And let's face it, the money for archaeology is peanuts compared with money for big rail schemes or big road schemes or whatever. And so to some extent, if there isn't money attached to it, it isn't valued by government, it isn't valued by politicians. And so it is extremely important to go for money as, as far as you can. And there is this, this sense that if it's exciting, I mean the Richard III stuff I'm sure has um, it generated a lot of interest. A, a friend of mine in Jerusalem um, works on getting a TB from ancient DNA with a view to seeing how it was transmitted um, in, in prehistory. There are things that actually are of value today, scientifically, that can come from archaeology and that do, I think, catch the public interest and even catch politicians' interest. Um, just on the, um, Peter mentioned the event timing. This is perfect timing for the manifesto. It, this is actually a very good time to have this event to start to put pressure. And you archaeologists should be going to every single opportunity you have to speak to your, you know, you should be to, going to your GP surgery, you should be going to hustings for local councils. Every time you can raise this issue of archaeology, you should be doing it with the politicians because they, if they get enough um, upsurge from the people that, that they actually want votes from, then they will start to listen. Yeah. Um yeah, it's a fair point to say it is about money, I quite agree, but having been a, you know, worked in local government, they worked in councils up and down the country, worked on every issue. Um, the big problem is it's not about a government turning around saying, hey, let's cancel HS2, that's the easy one. That would be, oh, right, we're not doing that, that's new money, 50 billion quid that doesn't exist as yet anyway. The problem is, is when you're sort of, I'm on the Hadron's Wall Trust. If you turn around to the Thumbland County Council and say we want £50,000, they've got to take it from somebody else's budget. And that's not HS2, that's out of social care, it's out of whoever. And to those people, £50,000 is a hell of a lot of money. So the problem with it is, I quite agree with you that saying archaeology is not a small beer in government terms, but remember most of the funders of this is local authorities. So we have to wonder, one of the big problems we've had with archaeology is a lot of the funding is non-statutory and therefore it's up to the up to the local authorities to decide whether it should be. In the present environment, making anything statutory is almost impossible. So you actually have to convince those people who hold the budgets to come forward. 
That's why I'm saying, yes, you can make the decision, but don't expect the decision to be easy, even if it's a small amount of money. I mean, going back to some of the fights we've had in the past for £100,000, you know, that was months of campaigning. Although, interestingly enough, um, I do remember, and there's a certain person in my chart mentioned, that that money was actually uh, achieved because uh, the minister couldn't stand one of the people in our group so much that she agreed for the £100,000 to come out of DCMS funds just to get us out of the office. <laughs> so, <laughs> the situation was kept. See, it wasn't, but anyway, it was quite <laughs> secret. But, you know, that's proper, that's proper politics at the sharp end, because you, you, we got £100,000, it was effective. What I would say, though, to everybody is, um, one of the great things about uh, the five-year terms is that unlike usually where you, you try and fight every year to find out what's in the manifesto, we're actually entering into that period where the manifesto actually makes sense, and that's next year. Um, the manifesto rounds just closed for most of the parties, over what was actually happening, um, and will now reopen quite soon for writing the final manifesto for 2015. So go and find out who on each of the parties is responsible for writing the manifesto. I can tell you exactly who the agenda is going to be, and as we're obviously going to be larger party next time round. Although if you want to join us, that would be fine. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and of course yourselves. <laughs> Uh, I'm, well, I know which, so, so I'm not sure which, uh, which um, MP is going to be, but I haven't seen who's uh, who's been reshuffled uh, <laughs> after this morning. Um, but uh, the uh, go and find whoever it is. Go and actually find their special their um, their assistants, whoever the MP is, who's actually doing it. Go and find the people in their office and set up a meeting. You know, because you can get through on that basis. Thank you very much, Lord Reedsdale. Um, can I now welcome um, Right Honourable Ed Basie, MP, Minister for Culture, Communications and Creative Industries, who I uh, hope is now going to uh, speak on behalf of government. Thank Thanks very much. It's a delight to be here, and thank you for uh, your reshuffled intelligence. I'm not yet in the Privy Council, but if you know something that I don't, then I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Right Honourable. Um, thank you for the lovely welcome, uh, sticking a placard from Kelmscott Manor outside the door, about a mile outside my constituency. Uh, my uncle has written three or four books about William Morris, so not only is there a geographical connection, there's also a family connection. And I'm hoping there's a quid pro quo for you coming here, the Society of Antiquity will arrange a special guide to tour for me. If we can use the young Scott man, that would be great. Uh, it is a reshuffle day, and uh, I'm still in the job. Uh, I said to the Prime Minister, I'm not moving until I've spoken to the Society of Antiquaries about the approach to archaeology. Uh, it is a, I do have a very strange uh, brief I was uh, reflecting on, on the way here, because I've just come from a meeting with a top media analyst talking about Netflix and BBC iPlayer. And 4G telecoms and so on. Here I am talking to an organisation that's involved in looking back at history over 900,000 years. But there is, I think, a connection uh, on many levels, actually. I think there's a connection. First, I think one forgets how important science is to archaeology. Uh, it might be that the average man in the street, and this is not to uh, criticise the average man in the street, might think that all archaeologists do is dig holes in the ground and brush the dirt with the things they find, but we know that. There's a huge amount of science involved uh, in dating and analysing the objects that are found and in conserving them and also using the latest technology to discover things that are laid underground for centuries or even millennia. Uh, I also think as well that archaeology is increasingly popular and it's partly made popular by television programmes like the Times View, which get a very fair audience and I think it has a lot of uh, popular support. And I am personally uh, passionate about archaeology. I mean, it's just something in my being that I love this idea of discovering objects that have been accidentally or deliberately uh, buried for many centuries and that thrill of being the first person to uncover it after many years. 
I've tried my hand at metal detecting. I can still remember the excitement of uncovering a 1972 pence coin in the field in my constituency. I remain keen to discover the equivalent of the Staffordshire Hoard. Uh, but again, I think the Staffordshire Hoard shows how alive archaeology is. Uh, somebody, uh, as a Oxford historian who spent some time studying Sutton Hill, was carried away by uh, the romance of that to discover something as significant, even more significant, in, in the last few years, shows uh, what archaeology is still producing. Uh, of course, the discovery of Richard III's bones uh, as well. Uh, and in my constituency, joining a metal detecting day where they discovered a great Saxon burial uh, site, uh, and only recently discovering, even though I've been the MP for for eight years, that we have an amphitheatre, a Roman amphitheatre, partially excavated in my constituency as well. Uh, I've, I've sort of picked up on the fag end of what Lord Greensdale was saying, and I would probably agree with quite a lot of it, not least obviously the uh, brilliance of this coalition, uh, but also the fact that some people might get the impression that archaeology is. Uh, in, not at the forefront of policy making. Well, for me, one of the first things I wanted to do when I became a minister was to secure the future of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. I thought the Port I think the Portable Antiquities Scheme is an incredible scheme. It's very cost effective. Uh, it brings together passionate amateur enthusiasts with uh, professionals. Uh, and I think it works incredibly effectively. And it's become something of a tradition of mine to launch uh, the British Museum's annual report on the portable antiquities scheme. <coughs> and I was very uh, keen to secure the funding for that scheme. We haven't obviously uh, completely inoculated the scheme from uh, the reduction in expenditure that we've had to impose uh, across many different departments, but I certainly made sure that the reduction has been far less than it was for. Uh, other uh, parts of my portfolio uh, because I thought, as I say, for a relatively small amount of money, uh, we as a country get an enormous amount back, and I think it's a very uh, well respected scheme <coughs> all around the world. Uh, I think the biggest issue uh, you face, and I think again what Lord Rizzo was alluding to, is the issue of local councils and local authorities and how uh, well they are able to carry out. Uh, their support for archaeology. Um, and I think that is something that I would like to hear from you about. I went to visit the York Archaeological Trust a couple of weeks ago. I'm attracted to this idea, but I'm very keen to hear people's views uh, on uh, the role the trust can play uh, in supporting archaeology, the relationship between government and trust, and whether that can be a more formal relationship with much clearer lines of responsibility, so I'll be very keen to hear from you um, uh, about that. Uh, in terms of the wider brief on heritage, we're just about to update our guidance on scheduled monuments. Uh, we were going to publish it today to coincide with today's seminar, but it's important to get it right, so it will take another couple of days to be uh, formally published, but we are able to publish it this week. Uh, as you know, we've got grand plans for English heritage, which I'm sure will interest all of you. Uh, we want English heritage to establish a separate trust for the care of its buildings and monuments. It's an idea that I've long cherished. I think it's a much clearer relationship to have what is at the moment called a National Heritage Protection Service for the purposes of our consultation. It may have a different name when uh, the dust has settled, as it were. Uh, what one might call crudely a heritage regulator, separate from a trust, uh, runs the buildings and looks after the monuments that are in the care of English heritage. Uh, I think that will have implications for a lot of archaeological trusts. I hope it will provide a great many opportunities for you to have uh, a good relationship with the new trust and possibly take on uh, more responsibility. So those are uh, where we are in terms of heritage. We've also, as you know, although again we've had to make uh, significant spending reductions in terms of the grant and aid we give to English Heritage, we've significantly increased uh, the amount of money that goes into Heritage through the lottery. So if one is talking about pounds, shillings, and pence, 
there is a silver lining to some of the spending cuts we've had to make. Um, I'm here as well uh, to listen. I think that there is a great opportunity, if again there's more retail set over the next 18 months for people in this room and others to influence policy. So I would be interested, as I say, in any ideas and papers that show the state of archaeology as it is today, what opportunities exist to make the relationship between uh, trusts and local authorities and government much cleaner and clearer. We do, whatever any political party says, we live now in a world where we're going to have to try and get more for less. There is not a jacuzzi of cash that any government of whatever colour is going to be able to turn off. Uh, we can obviously use the lottery money judiciously and there may be imaginative ways that we could look at uh, working with the heritage lottery fund going forward. Uh, but I think these difficult times present an opportunity uh, with local trust taking on uh, greater responsibility and clear of law as working with government and local councils. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm, I'm glad to have promoted rather than demoted to you. It's more than address, <laughs> which I apologise. Um, well, we've now heard from um, all of our panel members, and we're going to move towards a, a more open um, question session. Um, so, uh, audience, now is your opportunity to ask questions of our speakers, and um, <coughs> perhaps you might like to bear in mind in your questions um, the Minister's invitation to um, speak about our concerns, and I'm sure that local authorities, which the Minister touched on, will be one of those issues that people in the audience, audience will wish to raise. So. Um, questions, please. Uh, we have a microphone which I think is going to be taken around to questions. And, people say that they are when they ask the question. and yes, um, when you ask the question, if you could say your name and also the organisation that you represent. I think, Stuart, you were first with your hand. Stuart Bryant, uh, Local Government of Archaeology, uh, the, uh, the uh, acronym ALGAO, which I won't uh, describe before, but uh, representing Local Government of Archaeology, uh, which you've heard about uh, this afternoon, including uh, some of the background from, from Peter Hinton. And I'll, I'll begin by saying, yes, we are concerned, um, and we do have a specific ask, um, but it's not about money. I think. Um, uh, we do recognise that you know more resources are from central government is, is you know that's unknown at the moment. Uh, we, we would not like any more cuts uh, than we've had so, uh, so far. But our ask and by way of background is about um, the role of local authorities generally. And I think I would, I would say that we are generally supportive. Pete's mentioned this as, uh, as well of the government changes to planning policy. I welcome the recovery which is beginning of the construction sector, construction sector particularly in the, uh, in the south and, uh, uh, and around London. Local government archaeologists are concerned that the combination of the continued squeeze in resources and decreases in staff, at the same time as the number of planning applications and developments is increasing, is going to cause severe problems in the next couple of years within many local authorities. And a return in many parts of the country to the period before 1990 when most archaeology was destroyed without any record, resulting in the whole, wholesale loss of valuable information and our understanding of the heritage. And this is mainly to do with undesignated archaeology, that which isn't protected by other means. And it's the role of local government archaeologists to actually identify that archaeology and to ensure that the advice is given for its, its protection or excavation. Our question is really, is, is for the parties generally to confirm that they are committed to government scrutiny of local planning authorities to ensure that they all are implementing the national planning policy framework with respect to archaeology and providing at least a minimum level of protection for their archaeological heritage locally. Uh, that there are some uh, sanctions for those local authorities who willfully disregard their responsibilities. We're particularly concerned about the contagion domino effect of one local authority decided it's going to ignore the MPPF and those around that local authority saying, well, 
if they can do it, why, why are we spending our money on our archaeology service? So I think that, that's, our, that's our specific ask, and, um, uh, and I think it's, it's an issue that's becoming increasingly serious as uh, resources are squeezed, and those decisions are being made within local authorities about you know, whether non statutory services should be uh, protected or not. Uh, so, that's that. Thank you. Yeah. Minister, could I ask you to respond in the first instance? Well, yes, I can confirm that, and I think that um, you make a good point, which I should have made in my uh, remarks, and I'm sure uh, others who have spoken have made the point. A lot of um, what affects our project is, of course, uh, affected by the approach taken by the Department of Communities and Local Government. I obviously have to deal with local authorities on issues like libraries, where we try and work with them on their proposals to review library plans, and you can have, I think you can, you can have it for by uh, meeting with local authorities regularly and writing out. So I think one thing that is important uh, to you know, effectively remind you of by making a point is to have a dialogue with local authorities on our project matters uh, to check that they are on line with the planning policy framework and doing the appropriate thing. But also I would rely on you uh, to give me intelligence where you think local authorities are ignoring that. And I can I was willing to get in touch with you uh, and discuss it and I would willingly use a forum like Algeo as well to get the message across that local authorities should be taking archaeology seriously. Again, I suspect it is a mixed picture. Uh, those of us who are in Parliament representing constituencies uh, will be more aware uh, from their own backyard of what was happening. I was interested in the biggest development in my constituency appears to be complying. Uh, they've already uncovered uh, the foundation of the Roman uh, villa. Uh, and what is interesting about big development like that is it becomes part of the community engagement that gets people excited, uh, bizarrely, about the new phone, as well as obviously about the archaeology that's discovered. Stuart, did you want to follow that up? Or? Other colleagues may wish to... Uh, yes, indeed, I, I will. Yes, yes thank, thanks, for this. it's very gratifying to hear that, I think. Um, uh, we'll be in touch, and I think um, any, 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 any messages that you can, you, know, uh, you just mentioned that, that you can promote within inside government, in particular the Department of Communities, would be helpful. I think that we are very supportive of the policy, um, and uh, you know it's, it's, it's proven to be very helpful, um, and has raised the heritage up the agenda within the department, um, but I think it's, it's how it's implemented locally that I think we're concerned about. Other panel members may wish to comment? I, I support what Ed is saying and I, I recognise the problem that he faces, but uh, I think it might be worth uh, commenting that he had exemplified the libraries issue. I think the last time I looked, uh, despite the fact that there was widespread press and you know, comment about the number of libraries that were able to shut or go yeah. voluntary, uh, the department was only in contact with four libraries, the local authority that uh, provides the libraries. I wonder if you would like to reflect on whether or not the model that's been adopted here is really going to be effective. Yes, I would. And uh, thank you for turning this now into a good old ding dong. So make, uh, <laughs> make the rest of the hour fly by. Uh, well, you guys, you I'm regularly out that's how you want to turn it into a You missed my opening remarks. It's highly complimentary. And I'm a great fan of yours, by the way. Um, not to make this too cosy. But, um, uh, now we've uh, reviewed every single proposal by library authorities to, to reconfigure, if I can give to you for reason, uh, reconfigure their library service. And it's, a, it's a very tough thing because nobody likes to see any library closed, but sometimes you have to allow local authorities to grasp the nettle uh, to reinvest. But I can assure you that not a single local authority that has uh, put forward changes to its library proposed to its library service has not had a dialogue with uh, DCMS, and I'm willing to follow a similar model if it is to be put in place for our project. Do we wish to um, continue this theme for the moment? Um, uh, other questions from the audience on the local government theme? Um, Adrian, uh, do we have the microphone? Yes, Adrian Tindall, Federation of Archaeological Managers and Employers. Um, we represent archaeological practices, archaeological businesses, SMEs, if you like, up and down uh, the UK. 
and we are, our members employ probably two thirds of the archaeologists active in this country. Now, you gave the example of your couple of trusts, they're a member of, of fame, for example. But they are somewhat exceptional in that uh, many, of the, many of the larger uh, fame members are educational trusts, uh, charitable trusts, and so on. But in large part, their income derives probably 85, 90% from their engagement in development-led work. So even if they stand outside local government, for example, um, and I was responsible for managing the outsourcing of a local authority unit into an independent charitable trust. So I have no particular problem with the, the principle of that, but that in that particular example, that organisation, that outsourced organisation, still depends 85 to 90 percent of its income derives from development-led work and as was said earlier without the uh, the specialist expertise existing within local authority within surviving within local government that is the very lifeblood of those organizations so it's absolutely vital from the as it were users point of view that those services are maintained and uh, what are the prospects of local authorities sh sh sharing those services? I, mean, I think that has to be a way forward as well. Do you think that by losing too much, or would that be? I think to a, to a degree that exists. There are a lot of hybrid services that are part in, part out, uh, part in house, part external. And there are prospects of that uh, model surviving. But the problem is that you need that. Yes, I think could, could a number of local authorities. Uh, Sharing. Have their own in house, share in house expertise. Yes, I mean that, that again exists, and my colleagues in the local government might like to comment on this. Those sort of hybrids do exist, but there is a baseline, there is a certain level below which you cannot go, and certainly from our members' point of view, uh, if, it go, if, if local government provision drops below a certain level, their very life might will stop. Just a Really interesting, going right back to when we did the State of Archaeology report, looking at all these questions a number of years ago, had hundreds of responses. One of the things I find really interesting about this whole argument is, is the product of archaeology. So, is the product people digging in the ground? Is the product what we dig up because we've got warehouses full of Wessex that have got a problem where you come on the board of your archaeological trust and we're actually going to buy a whole new repository to stick all this stuff because nobody's actually interested in what it means once it's dug up. Um, or is it the television programs? Or is it whatever it is? This is one of the problems archaeology faces because when we're asking funding authorities, you know, the funding authorities can come forward with, we'll support you to actually undertake this service. But I always find it quite interesting because of, due to the very nature of what we created, the amount of great literature that is will never be read by anybody is sort of expanding and it's not adding to our sum of knowledge. You know, one of the problems is we're spending bar hundreds of millions of pounds over the years in archaeology, but archaeology itself, or the type of archaeology we want to see expanding, is perhaps not, um, doesn't exist in that way. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's it's that, but I, I, I just come back with a problem that a lot of people face when we're looking at funding it, is what are we actually trying to achieve through archaeology? And probably not an answerable question. Well, I think, I think there is a consensus, and a growing consensus, that we should not be carrying out archaeological work simply to entertain our own profession. If we're, if we're doing it for our own amusement, there is no point. What we are doing is we are enriching society by public benefit, by research progress, by actually uh, becoming a creative industry, if you like. And I think the days when we were content simply to fill in, uh, fill fines boxes and, and, fill, and produce great literature reports are thankfully <coughs> going. I think it's a really interesting uh, debate, which I think you know, gets us away frankly, from the narrow focus of party policy uh, about most psychology and about how archaeology could potentially Perhaps reinvention is too strong a word, but uh, dig laterally. So, uh, you know, I follow on Twitter this uh, organisation, Dig Ventures, which may or may not uh, 
raisin rye smile. Oh, I was a little bit. And then he asked me, I was going to speak about it, and I was interested to find, you know, a, uh, an archaeology uh, do crowdfunding. Uh, so, you know, this may sound utterly heretical to people in this audience, but, you know, there's not only is archaeology potentially, obviously, a massive tourist attraction, I mean, I was thrilled when I found out. Uh, that I have this small uh, Roman amphitheatre, it's obviously not the Colosseum, uh, in my constituency, uh, which is part of a kind of religious site that had uh, existed and adapted 2,000 years ago. That to me, you know, if I was to raise money to have that uh, dug out, that would be a tourist attraction, but uh, it also, as a, this is where I get into heretical territory now, as a leisure activity, uh, inviting people to join digs, uh, it's very rewarding, people would love to spend it. So there are, there are so many different ways in which archaeology can engage with the local community and, dare I say, raise revenue at the same time. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, I'm just sitting here seething. Um, <laughs> you know, the fact is archaeology is, um, you know, it's great fun and uh, you can involve communities and you can make sure that there is interest of, of that sort. But sometimes you don't find anything. And I'm not a big fan of time team, but actually that's one of the things I think it has shown the wider community, that actually you don't find something when you're digging. You can expect to find a lot, but sometimes you don't. And in almost every other form of science, you have that pattern as well. You, you, you know, you put a lot of money into, it to, uh, uh, into, the, into this science, but you may not get the results that, that, that you're expecting, or you may get no results at all. So I think it's a false idea that every dig has to produce something that has some sort of, I don't know, component that, that, that somebody should love. I, I, I just don't see that. And, um, you know, when I was an archaeologist, there's also the fact that while there was lots of money for digs, those are the days, um, there was often not enough money for the writing up afterwards, to, to make the writing up a really good piece of work so that you had a good record of what had actually happened. And so I think it's, you know, to some extent, archaeology has to be seen as something that contributes without necessarily having an end result that you can actually grasp. And it's very annoying to sit here and, and hear this. Why, why is it annoying? Because you're not seeing the wider benefits of, of what, what can be, you know. Sometimes research is built up over the years from, you know, various areas. You, you know, you dig in one area, you don't find anything, you, know, you dig in the next. And you can see patterns of movement or patterns of trade or whatever, but sometimes you don't get a direct result from a piece of, of, of from a D, but it still has value overall. But no one's saying it's an either or, we're saying it's a both hand. Well, just I just didn't see, sorry. You shouldn't see it, you should be I think the, the thread of this conversation started with um, local authorities, the provision of um, archaeological advice uh, in local authorities and the concern about the future of those services. Um, does anyone want to just loop us back to that um, key concern, which I think has been a real concern of TAF um, over recent years? Um, uh, John Lewis, back. John Lewis, the General Secretary of the Society of the East. Um, I think there were, uh, listening to this discussion, can you all hear me now? We could hear you before. Good. Um, there's some confusion on the part of the panel between funding archaeology and actually funding uh, the mechanism, the apparatus that enables it. Uh, in the conference that we had on 100 years of heritage protection, which the Minister was very glad, Gracious, did right before and before. Uh, what came out of that was a couple of things really that, that, that archaeology needs that we, if we are to explore our past. And it's not necessarily directly money. Um, first of all, uh, what emerged was that uh, we would like uh, the government, whichever party or party to in power, provide a sound legislative framework for um, protecting the past. And uh, that includes uh, not just scheduled monuments and listed buildings, but as Peter alluded to, the undesignated archaeology, your amphitheatre that you found in your constituency. The, the stuff, <laughs> the stuff, the hundred pairs of archaeology like that, turn and five, none of that is scheduled. Um, so, how do we protect our past in an integrated way? Provide a legislative framework. And the second thing, 
that we've talked about today is actually to provide the regulatory body and the regulatory mechanism that facilitates people like uh, uh, members of Adrian's organization, FIM, uh, volunteer groups, if, if needs be, to actually go out and explore the past. Because uh, 90, 95% of archaeology in this country is done in the commercial sector. The funding for actually digging the stuff up, recording it, and reporting on it is generally there from the commercial sector. What archaeology has been about that is actually synthesizing all that material from all those projects and telling regional and national stories of the past. We have been bad at that. And I said the point we have been bad at actually talking to the public in language that they can understand um, uh, rather than talking to ourselves uh, in a very academic way. So, so really, uh, what we want is a good legislative structure and a regulator. So something along the lines of sort of, I don't know, off water or off com, but for God's sake, not off um, <coughs> Now, I think there is an opportunity here with the splitting up of English heritage. There is an opportunity, and the minister actually, you discussed, you mentioned that in terms of a regulator, um, with, the, with the building side being um, uh, divided off, and English heritage becoming, you did mention the words, a regulatory body. And I think there is an opportunity to really examine now, in times of severe financial stress, how the regulation of the statutory protected assets, the shed movements and the high class of listed building, can dovetail more effectively, both academically and financially, with the um, uh, provision, the regulatory provision, which is, as we've heard, very fragile within local governments. There is an opportunity here that I think if the sector and the political parties could pull together. We could actually come up with a far better uh, answer and solution for our heritage than we have at the moment, and which could be more effective on so many levels. Very good point. Do you want to um Draw a question out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what I do, but I think that's Okay, panel, would you like to comment or? No, I'm well known as a statement. I think it's a very uh, interesting point. And again, I think you know, what, what I hope to come out of today's session, which will benefit all the political parties, is that the side of that enterprise would need a, um, as it were, a manifesto group uh, that can put together recommendations that potentially could be a consensus from the, from most of the archaeological community about the best way forward. And uh, it is always a pleasure for a government minister and perhaps even for opposition <coughs> spokesmen to hear sentences that begin, this won't cost you any money but. Uh, and so thoughtful uh, suggestions that could, as I sort of hinted in my opening remarks, provide greater clarity. Uh, and the kind of opportunities presented by the reform of human heritage, uh, I would welcome, and I'm sure I call it as well. Yes, I think that is, that's exactly right. That, that, if you've got a, that sort of proposal, then, then get it up and get it, get it out to us, and let's, let's see if we can find a cross party approach to it, because it doesn't seem to me to be something which has a very strong part of the land. Just on that, I mean, when I was a York Archaeological Trust, we were looking at um, one of the problems I, I think with English heritage is. Is it's trying to look after all these monuments, but it does it with one type of branding across the whole of the country. And heritage sites, by their very nature, are the centre of their own community. By branding them with a national brand, you take away its sense of place, its sense of community. And I think it's, it's a really intre interesting idea about this. I mean, I'm on Hadrian's Wall Trust, I want to go talk to the minister about ideas about how we can move on from that. Because You've got sites which are on Hadrian's Wall, which are English heritage, and you've got sites which are national trust, and you see their logos. But it's a Roman artifact. It's not actually owned. It was never built by the English heritage or national trust. <laughs> yeah, you have, you know, you're wrong. You've got, you know, there's English heritage bit, and there's a national trust bit. Whereas actually, we should start thinking about putting sites back into the local community. Because I, I do feel that there has been a move away from that. Any ideas you have, we're actually saying, how do you get people to go back and actually preserve their 
their monuments because the funny thing is, is all these all these monuments we're talking about have survived because people have actually worked to make them survive over the over the centuries. You know, they don't just very few of them have just survived in that format. They've been lived and they've been used over a period of time. And actually getting people to want in the local community to put time and effort into making them um, be successful, I think is really exciting. Another thing you can come forward that actually said, came up with ideas about that, I'm sure will be welcomed by everybody. As, as the party least likely to form the next government, <laughs> <laughs> I can promise almost anything, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> you to make that mistake. <laughs> Does anyone else have a, in the audience, have a follow-up question on the changes at Central uh, in English heritage in England that are proposed? I see a profound lack of interest in the <laughs> audience. So maybe it's time to move to something new. So who would like to ask a question? Mike Hayworth. Uh, Mike Hayward from the Council of British Archaeology. And we've, we've touched a number of times in the discussion so far on sort of influence in government and across government. Um, and Lord Stevenson, before you came, Minister, was talking quite helpfully about some of the ways in which we might get heritage in other parts of government. And I'm just particularly interested in your experience so far and whether there are ways in which we might be able to assist you and your officials. We recognise that your officials are a small in number two. And to make the case for what heritage can contribute right across government departments. And that on occasion might help the government, it seems to me, get itself into petrol difficulties, as I think it has in relation, to, for example, to Victory 1744, <coughs> um, although we still await um, the, the government's statement there. Um, and I doubt we will be able to give us much, uh, much update on that one. So that, you know, that's an area we're looking hard at, um, and we think there are some difficulties in the way the government's got itself into a position where perhaps um, we could have um, assisted more. Um, and you're also talking about how where there are opportunities for us to make our, our views known. And part of government's role, of course, is to provide frameworks and opportunities through consultations. Um, and again, an area, for example, that we've been long awaiting is the um, Treasure Act uh, Code of Practice Review, um, which I think you promised me uh, your first video diary uh, about a year and a half ago uh, was imminent. 
Um, and uh, maybe you could give us some of the news on that. But then the, the key question, and, and I, still, I think it's for you to initially, but I've moved to another panel's members' uh, thoughts too, is how can we get that voice about the contribution of the heritage right out across government? The All Party Parliamentary Archaeology Group, in, it, in its report a long time ago, uh, which Bill, Bill Wiesel was influentially, suggested a, a sort of a, an all party, uh, sorry, an all government committee, effectively, a committee of, of various departments to come together to focus on the contributions of the heritage. Now, maybe that, that, that's not the way forward, that hasn't, hasn't gone anywhere. But are there other things that should be being done, and are there other ways in which we can be helping you, um, at particularly at this present time? Uh, well, I think it's a really, it's a very difficult uh, problem, and it's one I uh, wrestle with a great deal, and uh, trying to get other government departments engaged is um, always a challenge. So, uh, all across my cultural, culture and heritage, there are issues that are relevant, education, health, policy communities and local government. But we are making, I think, significant progress. We're not specifically focused on heritage for a moment, but um, I think we achieved great success with the Department of Education on music and cultural education. We published two plans with them for music and cultural education. I should say, on cultural education, we had a specific section on heritage. We launched with English Heritage to support uh, heritage schools, so schools to concentrate on uh, teaching children about the uh, built heritage. Uh, so we have had success there. Uh, I'm making progress with Will's benefit on libraries with the Department of Communities and local government. So I've got them uh, much more focused on the fact that libraries are a local authority service. But it does, it takes, it's hard pounding because government departments do work in their silos, I'm afraid, and I'm, I'm sure these are just as good. So, but it's a constant con <coughs> conversation. Uh, and, I, and I think, uh, I, I think that some kind of ministerial committee uh, would be a very good way uh, for, provided there was enough meat on the bone and, and things that um, uh, people had to discuss. But I think the core department would be education, health, uh, communities and local government and DCMS uh, in terms of culture and heritage. Uh, although I think this, since you were talking earlier about you being a creative industry as well, uh, might also have some uh, relevance there. Uh, so, uh, certainly I think it's important. I think that uh, using parliamentary champions is a very good idea. Someone like Tim Love, for example, who trains in archaeology, already at the university, you know, in my opinion. Um, and uh, Lord Reesdale, obviously, as the senior, uh, as a member of the senior party in the coalition, um, also carries a great deal of uh, influence, as to, as to people like Lord Brimfield. Uh, so, uh, again, we should discuss that, and again, I think it's part of the um, Society of Antiquaries uh, report, uh, recommendations about the best way to, uh, to um, support heritage and archaeology across government departments would be welcome. Uh, I can't give you an update on the Treasure Act review, but I will uh, send an email as soon as possible. Um, and I have been fighting very vigorously uh, Heritage's Corner in terms of um, HMS Victory, and I think the Ministry of Defence has learned some valuable lessons. So watch this space. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, we will certainly um, follow up on your invitation and step to um, come forward with ideas, suggestions um, on, on many of these initiatives. Yes. Not in, in no sense to make a little budget, but just you know, there are sometimes occasions when it's helpful, I think, for a minister to receive activity looking into this in, in other parts. So um, if you've got ideas or things that, that you think ought to be given some reservation, then direct them to the upper house as well. We don't have three of us here. We, we have no staff and we have limited brains and very little act, active expression of, of, of our existence really, which is the wider public world. <laughs> but it's quite, we do, we, what we do have is time, and uh, we get, there are four questions a day in, uh, in the upper house. Uh, you know, and only occasionally do we have one DCMX, and I know one knows from experience, and if you stand it, there's some sort of the corner who says, oh God, here comes another question I'm going to have to research. <laughs> that's the way you get people active again. If you put down something that's not too aggressive or political, then it can sometimes lead to a useful exchange in either of the chambers, really, but, but I think particularly in this type of in our and that will allow things to, to allow the minister, for whom we have greatest respect, to continue to tramp that vital and making the case 
if you can come up with something that actually makes sense, I'm very happy to batter against the wall of treasury yet again. Um, because of, I think one of the things that is coming out is that we have to look at a new way and how we deal with heritage. Um, we have to look at new funding opportunities and, and but also one of the things is we shouldn't just think that it's a government responsibility. Because Hadrian's Wall is not, you know, is not owned, it's owned individually by different landowners and it's across. They look after it. An enormous amount of money and effort is put in by people who actually own them. You know, some of them make money out of what they're doing. But it, I, if, I, if I could say, yes, I totally agree, we're not just we're looking for tax incentives also for owners. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, the, the historic um, building um, uh, association, you know, I've talked to them. It's amazing what they've achieved by keeping some of these um, some of these buildings alive. And I think the prime example of that uh, was uh, my cousin, the Duchess of Devonshire, <laughs> who managed to keep. I mean, Chatsworth. Well, that's a line you.
uh, it could be uh, schemes from the Department of Communities and Local Government to help community projects, all of which potentially are accessible uh, from heritage by heritage organisations. So that's another thing not to lose really sight of, and, and part of the work perhaps that and then the Heritage Alliance does in the Society of Antiquities and the Biology Forum they want to do as well is to make clearer to members what big national schemes actually are relevant uh, to people who might be able to access those grants. I can't have, have much to the debate and I certainly can't top the line about my cousin Duchess of Devonshire. <laughs> um, my cousin the coal mine doesn't have really as much, sort of, although it's probably more duchesses than coal mines these days. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm struck earlier by the story about how um, the film industry has a 25% sort of, you know, tax break or whatever, and it's something that archaeology should have exactly the same, um, because it does draw people in, it's a source of a real interest to, um, to tourists, and I think that perhaps archaeology needs, um, you, you must get the most glamorous archaeologist you can find, male or female, and get them to, to present it. Because clearly, the acting profession probably got that kind of like break for the film industry. And um, that's, it, it's not only what you're saying, it's how you present it. And, and this whole thing about uh, people judging you on your look and that sort of thing. Um, you, you must never forget that. Even the Treasury might stand to that. <laughs> Step forward, please, glamorous archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have five minutes oh. of... Uh, sorry. Oh, He's not an archaeologist. Okay, we have five minutes of um, precious uh, question and debating time. Um, Kenny, at the back. Hi. Uh, Kenny Davidson from Landbridge Research Limited and Icon Institute of Conservation. Thank you much, Mother. Uh, just to take the, the discussion back in a slightly circular way, I think the most useful contrib contributions from the floor, I mean, from Asian Tindall and John Lewis, talking about how archaeology, how the archaeological profession actually works. As professional archaeologists, we are not concerned about preservation. This is about sustainable development. This is about managing e environmental change. Five years ago, there was nearly 8,000 people paid to be archaeologists in this country. Then came the global economic crash. Now there are less than 5,000. The biggest and most productive in terms of adding to our sum total of human knowledge about life in the past, biggest archaeological projects that have ever been in this country have been Heathrow Terminal 5 and the Channel Tunnel Railway. Archaeologists are desperate for high speed 2 to go ahead. The amount of work that will come out of that will be enormous. It will be really significant. We even say, even in 2009, just as the, the crash was really biting, the, the last government put money into capital investment programs, putting a little bit of, relatively little bit of money into during the A46 actually led to a spike in the number of archaeologists in work. It's entirely about development and the government's role in facilitating that is what many of us are concerned about. The role of local government archaeologists is of course crucial. They are, they are hinged sometimes, they are a weak hinge in that system, but it's the wider development process that is much, much more important to, to people in the, the population of professional archaeologists. Now I appreciate that the minister has to appeal to a wider electorate than just the electorate of, popular, of professional archaeologists. But in this room, in this forum, that's what matters. Okay. I mean, I think um, I'm a big fan of HS2 as well. So uh, we can unite on that. Archaeologists the infrastructure. I don't know how popular, <laughs> how popular you'll make a profession if you have archaeologists for a third runway. <laughs> <laughs> I work on that. I, work <laughs> I used to work on that. So it stopped in May 2010. <laughs> Howard Davis said today that more airport capacity is needed. There will be a runway somewhere, I'm sure. But, uh, but it comes, comes around to the larger question which we've asked before, which is the very nature of professional archaeology. Um, and we have gone through, you know, we did this in the report, and there is, there is a, an interesting, interesting development, I suppose, in unit-based archaeology, which was university-based, which seems to be on the wane now, um, to the larger trusts, and will some of those actually survive at the moment, which is a big question mark. But, I mean, one of the problems is market forces. 
when you have, when you have a profession uh, looking at uh, archaeology, you've got a big problem when it stops, as happened in 91. I mean, this is not the first time it's happened. I mean, look at Molas. Was it 400 archaeologists down to four? I don't know if it was that bad, but it was, it was okay. The figures were pretty annoying. Um, which is a problem. And we are facing a second problem, which is coming down the line, which is we've been training vast numbers of archaeologists at university when their fees were paid for. Now they're paid for their own fees. The chances of actually getting a job in archaeology is 0.1%. And it's ridiculous, it's so small that most people who have never, will never work in archaeology, archaeology get trained. And I have told some of the departments they are looking at a big fall off in the numbers. I'm not saying I've got a solution to that, but you know, it's going to be interesting how it, how it moves forward. And one of the, one of the, coming back to the local authorities, is if you start losing people at that rate, you start getting massive gaps in our knowledge. You know, have we got an expert in Roman set Roman Samian ware? You know, anywhere in, in, in the south of England. We have in the north. But you end up with these gaps and these, these knowledge bases disappearing. And of course, you know, once you've lost them, it's, it's very difficult to replace those over a period of time. So I quite understand the problem you're looking at. The only problem with it is we've gone to the market for market based archaeology. Um, and it's rough in the market. Although, uh, obviously, we've got a prospect going on at the moment, which I'm sure is another, another big uh, thing. And just to square the circle, Chief Executive of British Airways studied archaeology at University. Thank you, Helen. I think we've got one time for probably one last question over here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with the creation of the Heritage Administrative uh, Secretary to, uh, to coordinate uh, various historic uh, environmental agencies throughout Europe under the, uh, I believe, the control of the Commission, um, how do you see this as a, as a way forward for funding and for practical help for archaeology in, in Britain, or giving them past records uh, is something that we should be uh, Keeping a very close eye on. Well, Europe is quite good at, uh, which is quite good at supporting culture and heritage, and there are often uh, European grants uh, available. Uh, I confess that I'm not completely on top of uh, how Europe, the European Commission supports uh, archaeology, but it is again another uh, element of the uh, debate, or part of the ecology that we should uh, always bear in mind. Seems, it seems an inter I mean, I'm your sceptic, so I'm loath the idea of taking money from Europe because it's um, uh, it, it's overbloating and um, I spend far too much of my money anyway. But it does seem, in fact, one of the things for me about archaeology is it's not about particularly dig your eyes, it's actually about the wider context. And with the earlier, with the question before about managing managing environmental change, that's that's true. But sometimes, you know, the answer is not to dig something up. Is actually to protect it for the future. We don't have, you know, perhaps the tools, the money, or whatever to do it properly. And I think um, a little bit more of an overview, which is the sort of thing you might get from Europe, might be a very valuable thing. In fact, and I think I think the problem with developer-driven archaeology is that there is no overview. We just do what we need to do, which I think is the issue. Just just finish as a Europhile. Um, but, you know, as an archaeologist and a Europhile, just being on a dick, we showed it wasn't that long ago when we actually joined the main member of Britain and the chapel is a, uh, has come along during human history. You know, we shouldn't forget that most of archaeology is actually based on European trends. If you're actually looking at most archaeology, if you look at the spread of ideas, it, it doesn't stop at the channel. It, you know, it goes up and down the whole of Europe, and that is a unifying thing. Thank, Thank you for those um, sentiments and Jenny and Lady Atkinson from uh, Lord Greensdale. It's an excellent point, I think, at which to bring uh, the question period to a close. And um, I'm going to ask um, Mike Hayworth from the Council of British Archaeology and TAF member to close the session. Um, before I do so, can I just give my personal thanks to the panel? I think, unfortunately, Jenny, you have to close.
but we have two survivors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to like you very, very much. I'm glad we've got some survivors anyway, and uh, I'd, I'd obviously I'd also like to, to thank all the members of the panel, not just the survivors, uh, for their really helpful contributions uh, today, and also for their contributions uh, in recent years in their various roles. Uh, archaeology has come a long way in the last decade or so, partly because of Rupert and his, uh, his initiative to set up the All-Party Parliamentary Archaeology Group. The Archaeology Forum provides the secretariat to that group. And it does provide us with a really good opportunity to have dialogue behind closed doors, uh, where that's often necessary and useful, uh, with key politicians and with other people who can be um, asked to come and talk to the group. Um, you know, sometimes if we want to go and um, have a meeting with, for example, CLG's chief planner, uh, we might not be so high on his, uh, his list of people to meet. But if uh, the all-party group can ask to meet him and we can be there at the same time, it gives us an opportunity to have influence in the right quarters. And that's been another real benefit, I think, of APAG over the years. Um, and I think, as, as Rupert said, being, a, being alive and aware of opportunities as legislation comes forward and continuing to hammer home the messages that, that for the sort of changes we want to see, which are often not that significant, because government's role, really, is to create the framework within which we can thrive, both as a profession and as a discipline. And I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that one of the key things that we have going for us is the huge public enthusiasm um, and interest in our work and indeed the public engagement with our work. We're not just a profession uh, that's, uh, that relates to uh, developer funded work. We actually have a huge public interest and engagement in archaeology through the, you know, whatever label you want to put on it, whether it's public archaeology, community archaeology, there are lots of opportunities for people to get involved in understanding their local place um, and we got to want to work closely in partnership with them. And partnership, I think, is one of the absolute sort of key messages at the moment. It's one of the real benefits of the Archaeology Forum, that it brings together all the national archaeological bodies across the UK. This has been a very English-focused um, conversation, but the, the Archaeology Forum does work across the UK. Um, and that's been really helpful as well, also in coordinating our messages and, and making sure that those key messages get across to the decision makers uh, in, in a useful and united way. Over the last year or so, we've seen some very important developments, particularly in Wales and Scotland, uh, and both governments have actually produced very significant strategic statements in relation to the historic environment. We hope that we might see a similar statement coming out of the government in relation to England in the not too distant future, updating the 2010 document that, that Pete referred to earlier on. Um, but we need to be looking ahead, and clearly um, this is a timely event. One of the reasons why we set this event up now was we, we're very conscious that uh, manifestos are starting to be written where we have particular asks, and I think our, our absolutely fundamental ask is around that statutory duty in relation to local authorities uh, to ensure that that underpinning of the whole system in relation to developer-funded archaeology can, can flourish. And it's not one that requires a huge amount of public finance, it's one that levers in a huge amount of private finance. Um, and that's a real uh, message we need to keep hammering home, particularly at local level, where often that's not really understood. People still uh, generally have the view there's a lot of public funding, and that really isn't always the case. So this has been a, a very timely event, and we're very grateful to all of you who've come along and, and contributed through questions and, uh, and your support. Um, if you have further thoughts on some of the issues that have come up today, um, do feed them through to any of the constituent bodies that make up the Archaeology Forum. And clearly we'll want to maintain that, that dialogue with, uh, with Ed and his team, um, with other parties as well, to try and ensure that whoever forms the next government, um, that they have our interests at heart. So thank you very much for coming today, and we look forward to your contributions and support over the course of the next year and a half. And thank you again particularly to our panel members. Thanks.